This episode of Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Whether it's espresso machines, manual brewing devices, or general coffee shop needs, they seek to pursue the most innovative coffee products, both domestic and abroad, to offer their customers. Find out more at prima-coffee.com. This is Keys to the Shop, episode 48. How to taste coffee with U.S. Cup Tasters champion, Steve Cuevas. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools that you need to grow as a coffee service professional. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. It's gonna be a great one. So real quick here, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the show. And also while you're there, leave us a rating or review on iTunes. Uh, Be really grateful for that and just love hearing the ways that the show has helped you or your business. And uh, yeah, so today uh, we're talking about taste. We're talking about tasting coffee and communication about coffee. So how we understand taste, how we learn how to taste coffee and get comfortable with it, develop a knowledge base, and then communicate that to customers is not only incredibly important, uh, it's not the easiest of tasks. It takes an investment of time and attention, and depending on where you are focusing your time and attention, uh, your efforts, you will either end up learning a lot and furthering yourself in the industry, or you can pick up some bad habits and attitudes and and viewpoints and hold yourself back in the industry back too. So today we are going to explore these things with the 2017 U.S. Cup Tasters champion himself, Steve Cuevas of Black Oak Coffee Roasters. I'm really excited to have Steve on the show. He is the head roaster for Black Oak Coffee Roasters in Ukiah, California. He's been in coffee for over 13 years now, and he has many competition titles uh, to his credit. Of course, there is the Cup Tasters Championship, but also the Bay Area Roasting Friends competition took first place, um, top eight at America's Best Espresso, and also the Golden Bean competition um, in 2016 got two golds and a bronze, and this year, 2017, not a week ago, I think, or, or maybe a week and a half, A few days before we did our interview, Steve got back from winning overall in the uh, Golden Bean, which means uh, won the most medals out of out of anybody. So that was really cool. So in my conversation with Steve, we talk about how he came up in coffee to eventually become a roaster, and his thoughts on developing your palate, how to develop your skills at tasting coffee, some of the methods that he used and recommends for other people. Um, how to embrace a variety of tastes as you develop your skill. And and also we talk about how to talk to customers about coffee and the importance of humility and being human in that communication, in that process. So uh, there's much more in this conversation and uh, I want to get you right to it. So let's listen and learn from Steve Cuevas of Black Oak Coffee Roasters. Steve, it's my honor to have you on Keys to the Shop. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Dan. I've been waiting to be on this show for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first time that I met you was at Coffee Champs in Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember you uh, interviewing Lamb, Lam, and uh, I just remember seeing you doing a podcast. I wasn't 100% sure what was going on, but I just remember I'm like something interesting was happening, so I had to get a picture of it. Nice. Yeah, oh, yeah. You sent me a, a picture of that. That was cool. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Uh, good times. And I, we were just talking before recording. You have had uh, a pretty amazing year. You are the 2017 U.S. Cup Tasters champion. Huge congratulations. Oh, thank you. And you just got back from Portland at Golden Bean, where you won overall. Yeah, we won. Uh, we took nine medals. I think uh, five bronzes, four silvers. Wow! And then the overall. Man, that's huge. Uh, we're sitting with a superstar here. This is this is crazy. Oh, how, no. how are you feeling about <laughs> no. all that? Um, super excited. Uh, I, you know, honestly, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, last year, we kind of um, was our first year for Black Oak Coffee to be doing any of the competitions. 
And so last year we had really amazing coffee. And so we sent those out. We didn't even uh, attend the event thinking, you know, well, we, we don't really know what it was about. So we, we get uh, an email that we won two gold and a uh, bronze. And so <laughs> this year we just go back. Um, we didn't have the strongest coffees, but, you know, we made it work. We ended up um, submitting enough and won a bunch of medals and got the overall. I've been loving the uh, the photos of you with all those medals. You're looking like Mr. T. Oh, <laughs> I know. Michael Phelps. <laughs> right, right on. So, uh, but now this is this is you now winning awards, uh cup tasters champion, roaster, but uh how did you first get started in coffee? It's been a it's been a long road for you. I mean, what were those first steps into the specialty coffee uh, industry like for you? Um, so my first job wasn't necessarily what I would say a specialty coffee, even though it was in the title. I was working for this uh, chain of cafes, a specialty cafe in San Francisco. Um, they had a coffee program, but I really didn't really pay much attention to it. I was I was the baker at the time, and I was also on sandwich bar, and so uh, super high pace, uh, high volume, and so that was kind of the really fun aspect of it. And I kind of saw the coffee there and didn't pay much attention until I moved to the the East Bay. Um, I was living in San Leandro in this cool little punk rock house. And um, there was a coffee shop down the street where everybody was working at. And so um, the name was Zocalo Coffee House. And so I went to go work there. And that was my first experience with um, actually pulling shots, dialing in. And so it, you know, the first thing I read was, what an espresso shop was. And the first question that popped in my mind was one ounce by volume or one ounce by weight. And so, <laughs> True, you know, it never got answered for me. And so I just went on this crazy tangent of years and years of just learning and reading. And so that, that question is really what sparked my interest in coffee. And, and so from that point at, at that coffee bar, how long did you work as a barista before you ventured into uh, roasting? Oh, man. Um, so as a barista, so I, there's this thing where I'm really bad with time. I just kind of I always tell people I just kind of exist. I just kind of, you know, I wake up, I do my thing and then it's another day. And so my time frames of how long I've done stuff or how long I lived in places is really askewed. Um, but I was there for over two years, two, two and a half years at that shop. But as a barista, I've been on and off for the last 13 years. Um, and I've only recently started roasting. So I've, I'm rounding out two years. Um, so I'm, you know, getting close to my two year mark as roasting. Nice. So as a barista, were you really into flavor right from the beginning? Just the dialing in of flavor, tasting coffee was that what really uh, generated a lot of interest for you? So the espresso in particular was kind of where I was at for the longest part of my career. Um, I didn't really get into really tasting drip coffee until I started roasting because I was a barista. Espresso is what I made, so it's what I tasted, mm. and so you know. You start off and you get told, uh, this is what an espresso shot is, which at my time in like 2008, which was, you know, you put 21 grams in a portafilter basket, that's probably 18 grams. Uh, you pull an, a shot, one, one ounce by volume. And so since there was so much crema in it, you're probably pulling like, 15 to 18 grams out, you know, something really ristretto. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, there is something wrong with the espresso shot. And so from then on, you know, I was down dosing, up dosing, uh, coarser grind, longer shots. And so, you know, I was experimenting a lot with what I, with the dialing in. Um, you know, I know Chris Baca has a thing about having those barista renegades where they do all sorts of radical things and they don't follow the status quo. And I could totally see his point of view, but at my point, I had nobody to answer my question. So the only way I can do it was torture myself with espresso after espresso until I found something that was a little bit more palatable. And so when you 
I got into roasting. What sparked that? Why did you all of a sudden uh, go from uh, 13 years on and off a, as a barista to now wanting to uh, develop uh, your skills as a roaster? I, I feel like what, what Mark ended up saying was kind of true about everybody who's a barista at a certain point looks over at the roaster and goes, that that's a cool job mm. that, you know, like, we look at that position as a, a cool position, as a cool person doing it, or it's just kind of a, it, it seemed like that's where I wanted to be. I don't necessarily have a rhyme or reason other than I thought it would be a better, you, you know, like I feel you do, you do barista work so long and at a certain point you, you kind of are not done with it, but you're, your day to days are almost similar. And so you wake up and instead of working with different coffees or doing different things, you know, you're making syrups, you're, uh, you're cleaning up the shop. And so at that point you turn into, you start doing more of the service aspect of it. And so you aren't really pushing the coffee limits. And so then what I didn't know was how to roast. And so then that was the next logical step was to move to a position that I had nothing I had no knowledge of and then just start learning again. So to me, I feel to keep yourself interested, you just got to keep learning. And so just move to the next position. So uh, roasting is kind of the heart of the operation. Like as a barista, you get the beans and you extract them uh, the best that you know how. And the, the urn, you know, the batch brewer does the same thing and you dial in. So now you're like super close to, you know, controlling the potential of of everybody else's craft and uh, at least that's kind of how i see roasting and so in that process you've got to be able to taste things you've got to be able to know that what you're roasting is going to translate well on the bar is this where you kind of learn cupping is uh during your transition from barista into roasting so for me um to prove myself that you know i just can't i honestly i just came off the street to at black oak and i was just kind of like hey i want a job here and um they didn't really know who i was and so i just kept showing up and drinking cappuccinos on the side of the bar you know it's almost <laughs> it, it parallels mark's story where you, you sit there and bug them enough that they're like all right we we need somebody to do some work so <laughs> there's a theme um, here man yeah yeah and so i end up just doing the barista work and then I'm, um, you know, I see that they, they have a lot of stuff to sample roast. And so I, you know, I start asking, can I help cup? And so they start letting me set up the cuppings, set them up, break them down. And then once we were cupping, then they're all like, all right, we want you to do sample roasting. And so at that point they're all like, because you don't know how to sample roast, we'll, we'll do it off the clock. And I was like, all right, that's fine with me. So, you know, it was kind of, putting in the effort to do it. And so I do a lot of sample roasting off the clock. And so, you know, the bosses would catch me on the weekend when they don't show up, just cupping. And they're like, what are you, get, what are you doing? I'm just like, oh, I'm kind of excited. I couldn't wait till Monday. <laughs> and so I just start cupping on, on the weekend. And so then we have little improv cuppings on the weekend. And so from the sample roasting, you know, I think I only took about three to four months to where they were kind of very – they felt secure. I was able to hit my first crack and the developments and the weights were all on point. And so three to four months later, they were like, all right, time for you to use the big roaster. That's when it was kind of a little, it's a little intimidating. It's not, you know, fire is not the, the easiest thing to deal with, but you know, he, he did one, you know, John, one of the owners, um, he did one roast with me and then he was like, all right, I think you're good. I'm going to walk away and let you do your thing which was completely nerve wracking because you have a machine that can catch on fire. And, oh yeah. You know, yeah. It's my second roast. And so from then on, I kind of didn't look back, you know, and so just kept moving forward. So at this point, you've got to be pretty confident in your tasting skills, uh, probably more so than when you first started as a barista. Can you kind of compare and contrast like uh, the Steve of, you know, uh, roasting, roasting Steve at Black Oak with a Steve of Zocalo as a barista. Um, how did you describe coffees and flavors to people then? And uh, how, how do you approach that now? That's a, that's a really good question because I feel when you first start off your career, you kind of don't know what you're tasting. You're kind of just tasting stuff and you, you have a pass fail. It either tastes good or it 
does it. And so that was kind of when I first started off, I kind of knew it was wrong, but I couldn't tell you why, you know, was it bitter? Was it astringent? I didn't, honestly, astringent was something that got added to my vocabulary about like two years ago. Right. So I, I, I didn't even know what that meant, you know? And so I think, you know, back in the day, I don't think too many customers ask about flavors. So in the early 2000s, it was just coffee, I felt. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't really get too many of those questions. And now I'm kind of, we have a flavor wheel up on the wall. We're kind of like, you know, we're trying to debate whether is that Baker's chocolate? Is that like, <laughs> is that, you know, what kind of chocolate is that? Is that yeah. like cane sugar, raw sugar? Like, is that isovaleric like, acid? Is that acetic oh acid? Oh my God. Like, yeah, exactly. And so now we're like really splitting hairs. And then, you know, but then we're also trying to figure out what is, you know, you you you're, you can't tell a customer, oh, there's a lot of malic acid in this coffee because <laughs> they have no idea. So you have to really figure out, you know, I, I, I explain to people, I'm all like, oh, if it says cane sugar, it means a little bit of weight to it. If it's like molasses, it's a little bit heavier. So I'm like having to explain them. Uh, how the the weight of the sugars and I'm also trying to explain that you'll find these flavors in it because a lot of times people are like oh is there actual grape in it like and so it's it's a interesting um a thing to talk to customers about because sometimes you get a coffee that's just amazing like natural Ethiopia's and you don't have to explain that there's berry in it they're just like oh this is really fruity and so sometimes the coffee handles that for you you just kind of have to take them on the journey of tasting. So confidence in the way that you describe coffees to customers is is a pretty important aspect of the job because, you know, in part, a customer will come back more if they trust you. And if somebody buys a bag of coffee, for instance, that has, uh, for, like you said, baker's chocolate and raspberry, and they're not really tasting that. Um, now, it could be them, but... I, I do think that there is a, a way to be able to communicate that flows flavors either on the bag or in person that makes the person a little bit more likely to be like, uh, oh, nod their head. Yes. Like I, I can see that in confidence in the competition is a huge part of, of why you won. I mean, it's, uh, you had the fastest time at the U S cup tasters champion and that's reflective <laughs> of your confidence. Um, can you describe to us just, just briefly, like uh, for those who don't know, what is the Cup Tasters Championship involved and why is confidence such a, a big part of that? So uh, during the the regionals and the finals, you end up having, they give you sets of cups. Each set consists of three cups. Two of those cups are going to be the identical coffee. And then one of those is the odd man out. So you have to taste all three. And by just tasting them, then you have to discern which one is the odd man out and then place it across the line. And, and on regionals, you do six sets. And at the, the finals, we did eight sets. And so it was just kind of whoever got the most correct would win. Or who, if there was a tie on the number of correct, they went to the, the time. And so it, it was just a competition of ability to able to taste and also the ability to do it in the fastest time. So you have in that competition the potential to second guess yourself and go back to a set before yeah. making a decision. And a lot of times, from what I've seen at least, uh, it, it becomes maybe the wrong move, depending. Uh, like you start the second and third and fourth guess yourself. Um, that was an interesting aspect of this. I honestly, um, so when I signed up, my boss wanted to sign up too and so he just missed the time slot so he wasn't able to sign up so i actually gave him my um my spot and so he he was going to be cupping for for black oak and um when i landed in knoxville they actually let me know that there was still an opportunity to cup if i wanted to just sign up and then pay the fee then and so my um instead of doing all that training and practicing and kind of working on trying to figure out a routine or how I was going to do this, I kind of went into it just thinking like, oh, I'm not even supposed to be here. Uh, So whatever, whatever happens, happens. And so I was very nonchalant, wasn't stressed out about it. My main thought was just kind of like, 
well, you know, just do it. Let's see what happens. You know, what's the worst that can happen? It was my mentality. So I really didn't have any stress. Um, but I, I, I don't think that I feel the most confident. What's interesting is I don't feel the most confident about my palate. And so it's oh. interesting when, you know, I tell people that and they're kind of like, what? The champion? I was like, you know, I just went to Golden Bean and they wanted me to judge. And I was just kind of like hesitant because I didn't want anybody, you know, I didn't want anybody's scores to be on my palate. And so it was just kind of a like, what? You don't feel like judging? I was like, oh, I'm a little nervous. I don't feel the most confident. So it, it's an interesting thing. Like I show confidence, but in reality, I kind of you know, a little hesitant to say I'm great or even good. Oh man. Well, that makes you the, a better champion then, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it makes me, makes me more modest. I mean, it, I honestly, I have a lot of great palettes surrounding me at Black Oak. Uh, I got John and Keith and then, uh, we have a, a new guy named Tom. He's, uh, our, he does water chemistry for us. He's also our other roaster with all, all four of us. We all have, we all kind of pick point pinpoint something and we kind of taste enough to where we get a really good reflectiveness of what the coffee is showing. And so to me, I kind of internalize everybody's because I feel it's better to understand what everyone's able to taste and try to be like, I know what I'm tasting and that's the answer. Mm. And so to me, triangulation of different palettes is really kind of what I've, I really would suggest. Don't try to go out there and taste on your own. If you can taste in a group of three or more, I think it's way better than just one. Yeah, you would have to really stuff your pride. I feel like in in cupping, it, it might, maybe a, a lot of aspects of, of coffee and competition has to do with an individual's pride. But um, in the cupping room, you're writing down your scores and you want to see if you're calibrated with other people and there's this inherent... Um, am I as good as they are at pulling out these flavors or I didn't catch that aftertaste and they, they were totally right. Um, I, I think that's really interesting what you're saying because it, it reinforces this community aspect of coffee that's so important. And we say it a lot, but when it comes to judging our own skills, looking to other people's skills to help um, build uh, a good product is, is so important. Oh, absolutely. I, I've had multiple times uh, where somebody mentions a flavor uh, and then then it clicks. It just clicks with you. You know, sometimes you just understand it. As soon as they say it, you're like, that's exactly what it is. Sometimes you're tasting something that you just can't tell what it is until somebody says it. And I think that's kind of the, the best part because not everybody's uh, flavor lexicon is inclusive of every single flavor you know so it's it's nice to have a lot of variety of different uh, abilities you know one of our um keith is super sensitive to like defects and then we have john who's super sensitive to uh, sweetness levels and uh, acid and so it's just kind of a neat little thing to have everybody's kind of their own uh, specialize in their own palates. I, I kind of been working in coffee with more of a consumer base uh, mentality. And so I have a little bit more of a, oh, this French roast is going to fly or this, you know, consumers are going to like this or not like this. And so it's just kind of an interesting point with more people. So in your group, I'm interested to know, like, when you're selecting coffees and you're roasting and, and saying, this is the roast profile that we want for this coffee, are you doing so with, like you said, you have the consumer mentality in mind a lot. Um, but then we also hear a lot, and you know, Mark mentioned this uh, in his episode uh, of Onyx Coffee Labs, that y there's these acid bombs that go out there because they really taste great to the people cupping them. Uh, how, what kind of logic do you use in, in striking a balance between something that's approachable and something that's novel to you as a professional? Uh, that's, you know, honestly, that's a great question. Um, Black Oak is located in, uh, in Ukiah, California. So we're like two hours North of San Francisco. We're, we're at the very bottom of Mendocino or at the just past uh, Sonoma County. And so in all honesty, we, it's not like we're, uh, in San Francisco. So, for us, when when John and Keith took over the last coffee shop that was here, they ended up uh, doing a lot of single origins, lighter roasted coffee. And so the clientele was kind of used to the last coffee shop kind of had like flavored coffee. Uh, I wasn't here too. 
I wasn't here to kind of see it. I just kind of knew of that they had tons of flavored coffees. And so that was the clientele they were kind of dealing with. And so when they wanted to showcase uh, for coffee forward um, or coffee flavored forward, um, they ended up having a little bit of a pushback because nobody really had single origin before. And so it was just kind of the only coffee shop down the street was, you know, Starbucks. And then we have little pop-up uh, drive through ones that just do extremely French roast coffee. And so they had a little bit of a, not the most favorite view on some of those single origins. And so they had to start doing a little bit more medium, medium dark. Some of, they do French roast. They do a blend of uh, medium, light, and dark together. And so to me, what I thought was interesting was I, you know, what I always tell people was that I loved roasting. My first roasting job being black oak because I had the humility to do French roast uh, and dark roast <laughs> because it, it gave me a different point of view of um, we don't. I'm providing something for the customers. And so I'm not trying to give them something that I want. And so what ended up happening was just kind of like all the all the books that I had on, on roasting were single origin roasting. And so it was a little bit difficult when I start doing my French roast because none of it made sense. I couldn't hit the R over R had to, like I couldn't hit any of the stuff in those parameters because it was such a long roast. I was losing too much heat towards the end of it. I couldn't, I didn't have enough uh, BTUs to push the roast up at the end of it. So I was just kind of like, this makes no sense to me. And so it, it helped me understand a different style of roasting. And also it kind of gave me uh, an ability to understand what the customer wanted. We ended up doing, we ended up doing something where we have one French roast where we kept roasting it lighter and lighter and lighter. And we got to a point where we're like, we looked at each other and we go like, that's the French roast. That's the one right there. All that flavor, all this. And then we got our, uh, you know, we got some feet, some negative feedback where it was like, this is not dark enough for us. And so it was interesting because we were roasting to what we wanted at that point. And it kind of made us like look at each other and be like, oh, we kind of forgot why we're roasting. We're roasting for our consumers. And so we have to give them what they want. And so you know, our single origin is kind of our side project, our passion to say. And uh, so it, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing that it's paid off for us. Um, and in the prosumer world where people can recognize what we're doing, but in, in reality, all our bills, you know, we get them paid by our consumers and uh, for all our lawyer customers. And so it's kind of a, that's who we do it for. And the single origin is just kind of like a, you know, we know we can. And so it was just kind of a, a fun little job, a little project, I guess I would say. That's an awesome perspective. It's something that we talk about in in uh, as baristas in retail. We talk about how sometimes you don't want to serve a mocha because you personally don't like that drink. Or um, we see a wave now of the people starting to make uh, these drinks again with pride. And yeah. doing so because they know that the smile on the customer's face is the reason why they're doing it. And you're still making coffee. You're still buying coffee from farmers. You're still buying good coffee. And there's this like um, this mysterious force inside of you that you don't, you don't want to roast dark or darker than what you personally enjoy because you're afraid that your peers might make fun of you for doing it. Absolutely. That, you know, and, and that's kind of the hardest thing because, uh, you know, I go to the, the Roasters Guild retreat. I go to the, the event, the expo. Um, and, you know, I'm always I'm always reiterating about, you know, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do that. You know, like if, if a customer wants an eight ounce cappuccino, I just go, all right, I know what they want. They want that eight ounce latte with extra foam. Right. Like who cares how it's worded? Your main goal is to provide what the consumer wants. And yes, maybe that's not a cappuccino, but they don't know that. And so you kind of have to know who you're talking to, you know, and so, and then just work with that. Is there a balance? And if I could play devil's advocate here, because I, I find myself uh, like a hundred percent on, on your side of things at the end of the day, but then there is a, there is a sense in which um, we want to push things forward 
it's it's interesting to see that we've chosen to restrict things as a way of pushing things forward instead of expanding them. Uh, how how do we like push the industry forward? If I could just use a, such a general term, industry. Um, pushing coffee forward for for better and better coffee while still um, keeping an open ear and heart to the consumer uh, drinking that coffee. That, that one in particular is kind of a little bit of a, a hard one. That's such a, a huge question. I know the way, what we end up trying to do is that we, we do have our artisan drinks, and so we do have, you know, um, Keith, the, he's, a, he's, also part, or he's also the owner of uh, Lover's Lane Honey, and so we do like a, a honey with bee pollen, he, so he sources bee pollen as well. We do lavender, house-made lavender syrup, and so we offer artisan coffees, and then we also have like on the back of the bar, we have the, the pre-housemates like coffee slushy instead of doing blended coffee drinks, we already have it pre-made and it's just kind of frozen. So a frozen latte. And so it's kind of um, this, you know, for us, we have to, we had to provide it because that's kind of what our built-in clientele wanted. And so we just, you know, we just did it. And so there, there's such a fine line between if you're going to open a, a third wave cafe, like completely third wave, like eight ounce drinks, and that's the biggest, um, you're probably saturated somewhere like a, in downtown San Francisco or uh, Portland, maybe, you know, somewhere where there's so many novelty cafes that you can get away with that. Mm -hmm. But when you're held hostage to the environment you're at, you know, like and not even hostage in a negative way, but it's what is what is expected. If not, they'll just go down the street. You know, I, I feel like I feel like our goal is to to provide what we can and and also better than what other people are kind of doing around us. But, you know, we have limitations, obviously, you know, we're not going to go and buy a whole complete new type of milk or something like that. But we'll, if we can put two ingredients together and we don't have it on the menu, I think you can do it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, you know, when I was a barista, I just kind of, I'm like, all right, I'm bored. Let me put these two together and see what happens. You know, we've, we've done where, you know, at, at the, you know, I, I just put ingredients together. You know, it's kind of like playing mixologist. You're at work so often that you just got to do something different. I hear you. Yeah. So it's funny saying being held hostage by the environment. I kind of have an image of, um, I, I love Portland and I love coffee dense cities, you know, um, because I love the coffee that people serve there. But in a, in a weird way, it's almost like that saturation. It's, it's, uh, it can be an echo chamber, but you can be held hostage uh, by being in that environment too and miss out on the kind of things that you're yeah. describing because you don't have to necessarily bend your mind a little bit farther to expand coffee uh, to what the consumers are looking for because you've got so many um, ex-baristas coming into your bars and so many coffee professionals coming to your bars, you know, foodies and, and things like that. But when you're out in the country or you're you're in places that aren't city centers, um, you're kind of getting like the the salt of the earth type people that yeah. are going to drive kind of drive the industry, and they're the ones buying Folgers and Maxwell House and, and everything else. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I you know that's that's kind of where I feel like we have single origin, we have pour overs. Um, we're able to do that for if like uh, somebody comes in that's considered a prosumer, but then we also have like our three parts, uh, medium, light, dark blend for our regular in-house customers. And so we, I feel like we have a little bit of everything for everybody. And so it's just kind of really knowing, it's understanding who, you, who you're talking to. And for me, it, it's, you know, honestly, if we ever expand, I feel like we would do very good in San Francisco. You know, I don't really know where we're going to end up. Uh, we're, we're looking to, but I'm not really sure what's happening with that. But my my vote is San Francisco just because not too many people are wanting to do third wave, darker roasted specialty coffee. And I feel like that's kind of the, the niche. You know, that's my mentality was there's a lot of people who laugh at, you know, or make fun of 
darker roasted coffee or don't call it specialty coffee or if there's a little hint of roast on it just like oh that's sub 80 but you know you look at sudden coffee and that was kind of one of like that that was such a huge inspiration to me where i was just kind of like he had the 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 guts to do something that our whole community was gonna not maybe be on board maybe make fun of it just you know and to me I remember getting those three vials of sun and coffee and I was so excited. I couldn't wait to get home because my mentality was at that point was like, he is going after a whole market Mm -hmm. that the rest of this industry doesn't even want to consider a market worth even discussing. And so that's kind of where my mentality is, where if you ignore part of the market, then you're ignoring, you know, uh, customers. And so I don't think you can necessarily do that. It, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily right. You know, I, every once in a while I get a customer who comes in and they go, I'm sorry, I'm going to put sugar in it. I know you don't want to see that. <laughs> and then I just, you know, I just tell them, I'm like, this isn't my coffee. This is your coffee. You add, you add whatever you need. If you need me to do anything else, it's your coffee. Feel proud about it. Be happy with it. Enjoy it. Don't be ashamed of it. And mm. so, you know, every once in a while, I, I need to have a milkshake too, an espresso milkshake or something like that. And I don't feel guilty about it. And I don't think anyone else should. Well, everyone, I hope that you've been having a good time listening to Steve talk about tasting coffee, his journey. And uh, I just want to take a moment here to talk to you about our sponsor on Keys to the Shop, Prima coffee. So Prima Coffee is a specialty coffee equipment supplier based out of Louisville, Kentucky. And from the beginning of their company, they have set out to make the best coffee brewing equipment available to the general public. And their focus is on curating the best equipment for every need from grinders to espresso machines to undercounter fridges. There are a host of high quality items that uh, Prima Coffee carries If you go to episode 42, Supplying and Selecting Equipment with Steve Reinhardt of Prima Coffee, you can learn more about what they do uh, and get some tips on selecting equipment right from the horse's mouth. And it's evident in that conversation that the emphasis they put on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation is something that they take very seriously. So go to the website, prima-coffee.com, check out what they have, Reach out to them, ask them questions, send them emails, um, shop on their website, and tell them I said hello. And thank you, Prima, for your support of Keys to the Shop and also your support of the coffee industry by supplying the tools that we need to do our jobs well. So let's get back to our conversation now with 2017 U.S. Cup Tasters champion Steve Cuevas. So I want to switch gears here because, you know, we've talked a lot about how we want to be consumer facing and in, in the end, it's a healthier perspective, I think. And and I think you would say the same thing. Um, when we're on our bars, when we're roasting and we're tasting coffee and we're, we're wanting to communicate flavor to the customer, what are the best things that we can do to, uh, calibrate our palates, to expand our palates, to encompass, a, a a bigger spectrum of flavor, but do so accurately. To me, the biggest thing that I I ended up feeling like I learned from was doing flights of coffee. Um, I, I know when I first started drinking drip coffee, if anybody, it, it's the same thing. I just started drinking wine and uh, or any whiskeys and stuff like that. Anytime you drink one drink, you only have those notes to pick out from. And so when you have one coffee and someone that says, what does this taste like to you? Everybody's first thought is like coffee. Yeah. Like it's a question and, and but you don't have a, a point of reference. And so if you can do something like do a Central America against a, a washed Ethiopia or a natural Ethiopia, even better, um, do things that are radically, radically different and you'll be able to taste the differences. Um, if you taste two of the 
two coffees from the same country, you're going to have to be able to have the nuance to differentiate between the flavors. But if you start off with like a really big regions, like you go Africa and then Central America, you'll be able to be like, well, this one tasted more milk chocolatey or more a uh, little bit laguny um, or more berry or more oolong tea or green tea. So I always say the more coffees you can have to have a contrast, I think would be much, much better. Um, but as far as developing palette, I think the biggest game changer for me was um, really working at Black Oak and hanging out with uh, Keith Fagan, the, the other owner um, of Black Oak. And we've gone to a lot of different restaurants. We've drank whiskeys, scotches, uh, Japanese whiskey is one of my favorites at the moment. We go to like Michelin rated restaurants or Michelin suggested restaurants. And so to me, the more, the more you, different things you can taste, the better. Um, something I always tell people was, uh, so Todd Goldsworthy from Clatch Coffee, uh, his advice to me was the best. He said, anytime you eat, you taste anything, always do it. Like always think, mm. eat consciously. And it hit me that I used to just like, oh man, I used to just just stuff my face. And at that point I was just like pass or fail. It was either really horrible and it was not edible or it was just edible and it passed. And so he, he really gave me the point of reference of anything you do, taste, you know, taste thoughtfully. And so I think that really changed my mind because it kind of, when he mentioned it with food, I was just like, you know, I was tasting coffee at the time, but I really wasn't thinking about tasting food. And so that kind of really changed my mind. And then Keith added uh, alcohol beverages to on top of that. And so there's already a huge, huge, you know, tasting community in the wine and whiskey and scotches. And so it just kind of reaffirmed that tasting is everywhere. And so that just, you know, anything and everything you do, you can taste. I really love that because you gain so much time. You know, instead of thinking about how you need to practice for an hour cupping uh, or tasting coffee, you just make it a lifestyle and a mindful event. Absolutely. So when we are tasting everything and and we are becoming more confident, and your kind of uh, your mind is such a powerful thing, it will start storing all of this knowledge. And and when you're tasting, it'll just come back to you. That tastes like that one whiskey or a taste like that, whatever it was that you ended up uh, really thinking about. Um, when we communicate to customers, we can't necessarily say those things, but for our own judgment of, of how to tweak a roast or how to dial in a shot, it's pretty useful. How do we, how do we play around with the limits and, and know, okay, I can't really say this, but I can say these things and the consumer will, will get it. How do we know the balance between those things. I feel like one of the most interesting things was uh, my training at the SEA um, for my barista level one and two. One of the first things they, they teach you to ask is, how are you brewing this? Your first question is, you know, how do you brew it? If it's just kind of like um, a simple machine, you know, maybe they're not as educated or maybe they like something very simple. So then, then you have to ask, you know, how many people are you making it for? And then you start really delving about what they're interested. Um, my, my second question is just kind of like, well, what kind of coffees do you like? Do you like lower acids, higher acids? And so if they maybe say something like a Central America, maybe they like more of the simplistic nature of the coffee, lower acid, a little bit more milk chocolate. But if they say something like uh, an African coffee or something with tons of uh, berries or fruits or even, you know, like super acidic, then you can maybe start guessing that they're into the nuance of the coffee. And so based on a little of the information that you have to ask from them, you can kind of figure out how to reply to them. It, you know, so you, you kind of fill it out. It's kind of like a, a back and forth with them. You kind of I don't I don't start off anything with too much information. I kind of see how they're receptive to it. If they kind of they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I really understand that because I've tasted these countries and they, they taste great. And so then you can start delving into more 
But if they're just kind of listening, then, you know, I just kind of work more of the simpler flavors, more of the it's very if it's sweet, if it has a good body, a good mouth feel and some of the more more um, standout flavors as opposed to trying to pick out the it's a jasmine green tea or an mm-hmm. oolong or a, uh, a white flower. And so, you know, I see the reaction and I just kind of work with it. And so if they work with me, then I, we keep pushing it. If they keep asking more questions and more and more complex questions, I just keep answering them. But if, if I feel like we're at a happy medium where I feel my replies were appropriate to their knowledge, then I, I feel like we're in a good spot. Man, it's so much like uh, service in the cafe looking for the buy-in moment if a customer is not wanting to have conversation necessarily and watching their body language, watching how they reply. Are they excited? Are they tired? Are they faking using their phone because they don't want to talk to you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's brilliant. And, and when you know, we, we call it the bean wall. Like when someone's at the bean wall and, you, you know, you, you approach them, um, oftentimes, you know, we'll, we'll ask them, let me know, we'll say, let me know if you have any questions. Um, and I, and I think that's a very common, um, response that a barista has to a customer approaching either the bar or the shelf. Is there anything wrong with that question? What's a better thing to say when somebody steps up to that whole, you know, beautiful shelf of beans, when you're approaching them, how, how is it to, what is the best thing that you can say to start that conversation? To me, I, I always try to do something genuine. I try not to script anything. So, like, to me, every situation is a little bit unique. If if I see them, like, holding the bag, I'd be like, oh, I see you selected a, an Ethiopia or a, or a Kenya. Or, you know, I, I might reference to what they're looking at. Or, uh, you know, I, I say something like, oh, you know, if they're into the light roast. I'm like, oh, I see you're looking at one of the lighter roasted coffees. Um, but I, I feel like what you say is one important aspect, but I feel like for me, the more important thing too is the eye contact because you're really looking at somebody and seeing how they're being either receptive or not with what you're doing. And so if you're kind of like not making eye contact, you're not really um, trying to make that connection, then it can come off a little cold. It's just kind of, uh, you know, your, your customer service and that's what you are. But if you're able to, you know, banter, chit chat, and then, you know, be, be friendly. I, I feel like be human, I, I think is more of the aspect and um, always addressing what their kind of, what, what their, their needs are is more important, you know? Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. Um, what are some challenges that we will face as we seek to, taste coffee accurately and generously in a way that, uh, you know, opens up our experience to relating to our customers. Um, what are some things that can trip us up that we should be aware of, like, um, treating processes differently or, or getting inside of our own head? What are some things that you've experienced that people sometimes, uh, have get in their way? I, I think, I think, um, honestly, different, different countries, that I've never tasted before um, or different processes. Like uh, I know anaerobic is popping up, uh, China is coming into play. And so there's these new new areas that we haven't really uh, dived into fully yet. And so instead of being, oh, I didn't like that or that was super off uh, and just kind of being uh, judgmental of it, um, try to understand how it might get viewed by somebody else that isn't you, a uh, consumer. You know, it, a lot of times the lower acid coffee isn't really a prosumer thing. And so if that was the case, then a lot of people wouldn't be doing Central America. Uh, so we, you know, the, the customers really want us to do that. So that's what we do. And so sometimes you taste certain coffees that you look around and some people go like, whoa, that was funky. And then you go, yeah, but what would the customer think? Like, what what are you tasting in it other than, like, it wasn't the standard set of flavors that we're used to, but was it negative? And so at that point, you know, me personally, I don't like, you know, certain types of food. Like, 
blue cheese was an acquired taste. You know, nobody liked blue cheese as a kid, but as you grew older, <laughs> you everybody learned to love it. And so if you, everyone just stopped making blue cheese because we all hated it at the beginning, we wouldn't have that. And so to me, some of those, those countries that we don't normally show off would not be on our menus. And so you got to think of it as who is this for and not what do I think of it? Wise words, wise words. So something that we didn't talk about yet was um, Budapest at, at Worlds, at the World's Cup Tasters Championship. Uh, I wonder if you could share a little bit about that uh, adventure. So it, it was it was a little bit humbling. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I got there. Okay, so I had a hard, I had a terrible time getting overseas. Uh, I ended up booking a little, a, a nice trip out there. I was going to land in Vienna, then go to Italy, and then head over to Budapest, uh, you know, and then finish it all off with going to France. I was like, I don't get to go over there, and so I might as well make a whole trip out of it. So when I went to the airport, I could not get on the plane. My passport didn't have enough time on it, and uh-huh. so I had to, I had literally had to fly to Seattle, uh, go to the Seattle um, passport agency, get them to give me a passport within an hour to fly back home, and then a day or two later, then I had to fly out. And so, with the help of a lot of people, um, you know, we had a, a photographer in town. We had a, a lot of coffee shops reach out to me and help me and give me advice. Because in all honesty, when I was at the airport and the, like before anyone started saying any like the nice words and stuff, I was like, all right, well, where else can you send me if I can't go to Europe? And so it, you know, everyone just said, you can do this. And so I ended up with a lot of encouraging words, getting it done. Um, and so it was a huge struggle to get out there. So I get out there and the competitions happen. And so what ended up happening was that I guess the, t- the, the whole committee of the of the worlds kind of switched over is what, from what I was told and so the committee actually wanted to standardize the temperature of the cups and so what they ended up doing was they poured all three sets of everybody at the same time and they kept them at a hotter temperature than we were than I'm used to cupping in the United States and so what what ended up happening was on cup 1 I burned my tongue oh no and so yeah, I freaked out. I freaked out. So my first three, I couldn't taste. So I just guessed. I tasted them. And I was like, I don't know. I think this is the one. And so the first three, I just guessed. And then on cup four, my taste buds got used to being burned. And so I was able to taste. And so I got three of the next four right. And so it, it was still not good enough. The The top 12 were um, seven, like all, all of them were eight for eight, except for one person was seven for eight. And so it, it was interesting because I had a, 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 a talk with the Costa Rican two-time champion, the returning champion, and he had the same issue with him. He, he burned his tongue on cup one. And so, you know, my mentality was like, well, at least it wasn't just me and it wasn't just the, you know, but the top 12 that went on did amazing. And so they they're cupping at hotter temperatures. And so to me, I was just kind of like, all right, I just got to train with hotter temperatures. If I, if I do have the pleasure of making it back, I have to train for that. It it was just, uh, you know, it was just something I wasn't expecting, but it was still something beautiful to watch nine, like 10 people go eight for eight. It was, you know, it was humbling. You know, I didn't expect I would be able to do that. And so it was still just amazing to be there. It was still an honor to go out there. And, you know, every time I'm on any of these types of trips that are all coffee related, I always just kind of think to myself, all this just because of coffee. <laughs> and then I'm grateful. Wow. So a great experience to be had there. And nonetheless, I mean, um, it sucks that so much happened that was kind of outside of your control and um but seem to have handled it with a, a generous spirit my mentality on all my comp- competing my competitions all this stuff like my mentality i always tell people i don't go to win every competition i go with the intention of like or with the idea i'm gonna end up losing but 
if I learn one thing that I can take with me to the next time, then it was all worth it because you, you're never prepared for anything until you do it. And that's kind of why I ended up doing the Brewers preliminary uh, before the Golden Bean this past weekend or two weeks ago. Uh, I've never done one. I wasn't prepared. I wasn't ready. I've never even gave the speech that I gave to the judges. It Literally the first time I gave the speech was to the judges. And so my mentality was always, if I learn one thing, it's not a complete failure. And I can use that to my next time I compete. And so that's my mentality on this. That I, I, th- I think we could all use a little bit more of that mentality as we progress through life. And uh, we just had an episode talking about mistakes and uh, little, you know, things that go wrong in our careers or quote unquote wrong um, end up being really pivotal moments for us. And we can look back and say how much we've grown in those things. Um, so uh, any final words for uh, the listeners of Keys to the Shop out there that uh, are w- wanting to pursue uh, cupping? Maybe they want to do the Cup Tasters Championship. Maybe they just want to talk to a, con- a consumer or a customer uh, more confidently and, and, um, welcome them into specialty coffee more confidently. Any final words of advice to them? Yeah, I think honestly, um, the two things I would want to say is, um, first off the, these competitions are not only the best of the best. It's who's brave enough to compete, who's brave enough to fail on a public stage. And so in all honesty, you have to have the courage to completely fail in front of people. And if if you don't have that, then you won't have the ability to be at the spot when you actually succeed at these things. And so don't be afraid to to um, go out there and give it your try. I've been getting a lot of questions about like, do you think I should I should try the cup tasters? And I told them, you know, honestly, it was the least nerve wracking. It was the easiest one. You just taste, you choose, and that's it. The the roaster one was just as easy because you're not mic'd up. But now they're going to mic them up and record them. So I'm like, oh, starting to stress out about that one. Wow. And yeah. And so, you know, I look at the baristas and I'm like, oh, not at all. I'm not even going to try that one. And so just, you know, I, I just say, just try it. Uh, I think there was a funny story. Ben, Ma- ben Morrow, when I saw him in Budapest, was actually, I believe he told me he signed his mom up to one of these cup tasting competitions. And I believe she got four out of six right. Nice. And his, yeah. The point he was trying to make was just like, you know, anyone can do this. And so it was just kind of like, just just try. And the, the second one is, you know, for me, I, I, I like to give credit to everybody that's uh, held the conversation with me, uh, it's given me advice. It was the same thing too, like about Mark, you call up anyone in this industry and they'll, they'll help you out. It's so inclusive nowadays. Uh, I think roasting is getting to that point where um, we're starting to film what we're doing. And so I got to see some of the the roasters routines from this year's competition. And so instead of keeping them all secret, it was amazing to meet new people, you know, making friends with Cameron from Revelator and Mark, Mark from Onyx and uh, the whole Onyx crew in general is just an amazing bunch, but everybody is open with what they're doing. And so I like to say, I'm, I'm, I am honestly a collection of information that was passed down by the previous people to me. And so I am an open book to anybody that wants to ask. None of this information is something that I made. I came up out of thin air. It's just kind of a collection of, you know, past people. Maybe I put two people's things together and I got a new twist on it, or I, I, I have a different observation than other people, but it isn't new. And so to me, it's just ask each other questions, answer each other's questions. Um, I think there was a, there was one one uh, roaster at the the Golden Bean where he told me he was like, "Watch out, next year I'm gonna I'm gonna go after your title and I'm gonna take it from you and I'm gonna like win and all this stuff, right?" And I just was like, I just giggled <laughs> and I was like, "Don't worry about it because once you learn all this extra information, I'm gonna learn what you learn and then I'm gonna use your information to win next year after that." <laughs> and so, so, so we just kind of you know it's like a friendly competition. 
you know, you learn something, I learn from you. And so, in all honesty, I think I'm waiting for all the new roasters to start spouting off what they, they're learning with the their, the, their, their techniques. And then I can use that to help myself again. And so I'll help whoever needs to be helped. And then the younger, the younger people coming in are going to have a new spin and take on it. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're just going back and forth with who's, who's educating who at the time. And that's how we push the industry forward. I think is, is we, uh, collaborate and we, we have that kind of a, a posture towards one another where we share our information and together that classic kind of cliche uh rising tide floats all ships um roasting in the future is just going to get better because of of uh, folks like you having an open heart to be able to share uh the information with people who want the information um and baristas managers whoever we are in specialty coffee um if we all follow that advice i think that's going to really bode well for our industry in the future. So, man, I, I'm, I'm really thankful to have had you on the show, Steve. Thank you for spending the time with us today. Oh, no, dude, thank you for even wanting to hear what I had to say. <laughs> you know, in the day-to-day of the life of a coffee professional, there is a tendency to be an echo chamber um, in our community where we continually sort of hear our own words back to us and you know we're always agreeing with one another and it continually narrows our viewpoint and the way we think and communicate and also what narrows how we welcome people and that that's a problem that we we can uh, experience in coffee that i believe steve's words can help counteract so some of the things that we can take away from what steve said today uh you know when we start to develop our tasting skills and we acquire more knowledge Um, one of the tricks is to taste in a mindful way. So basically anything that you eat or drink, be a taster, be somebody who pays attention to that. I mean, you get way more opportunity to, uh, develop that, uh, mind palate connection, if you will, if your whole day is spent being present in the tasting that you do. So you're going to improve your ability to connect with flavor if you're always looking for an opportunity to connect every time you you consume something. And also, when you taste things and when you're at the cupping table, think about not just your preferences, uh, which as a coffee professional really starts to become these high acid coffees, you know. Think also about the what would a customer think of this coffee? Uh, not everything that's different is bad. Now, there legitimately are some bad tasting coffees out there, but um, then there are some coffees that taste different that we think are bad because they're not within that narrow spectrum of, you know, SL28, SL34, uh, Kenya coffee that we all tend to, you know, subconsciously gravitate towards, um, the jasmine, the tea-like, etc. cetera. So in this respect, I really love Steve's approach. It's a generous and welcoming method of tasting coffee. And, you know, hospitality is about embracing, and that means we first have to consider the person across from us as a person and not just a thing that we are kind of like talking to and practicing our opinions on. Um, it's a give and take. So those tips that he gave us in communication are really critical. Um, there, it, it is a give and take. It's a, it's a relationship. Uh, however brief the interaction is, uh, make good eye contact, be human, and be friendly. Make it a back and forth conversation where you're paying attention to that buy-in moment. If they don't want to talk about the coffee more, then you should be able to tell that they're not wanting you to continue talking about the nuances of, of this coffee And you should be able to pivot quickly to something else that is more to their liking. In in general, Steve's thoughts around tasting and communication, I think, brings hospitality into the equation in a very tangible way. So the decisions that we make about coffee on the cupping table need to embody the hospitality that we hold ourselves to on the floor as retail professionals. And so maybe if we take Steve's approach, kind of in Danny Meyer fashion, We can say that we're not tasting coffee and communicating coffee to people, but for them. 
So my thanks to Steve for coming on the show and uh, equipping us with some good uh, tips and also inspiring us to uh, kind of up the level of our hospitality in the way that we taste coffee and the way that we communicate about it. So if you want to know more about Keys to the Shop, you can go to keystotheshop.com. You'll find the resources page has the show notes for our episodes. And if you want to reach out to me directly, you can email chris at keystotheshop.com. I look forward to hearing from you any stories or questions you have, suggestions, ways I can improve this show for you and make it more valuable. Uh, I definitely want to hear that. And so uh, thanks in advance. So go this week and take that message of hospitality in tasting and communicating flavor and information to customers and make it a reality in, in your practice personally and in what you do uh, on the floor at your store in your cafe. Thank you again for spending time with me today. And as always, I hope that this episode, as well as every other past episode on the show, has given you keys to the shop. <laughs>